and I'm with the City of Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability. And I am really excited today to share with you your green home inside and out. I wanna start by telling you a little bit about my department, the D Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability, because you've probably never heard of us before. We were formed back in 2004, and then we were called the Office of Environmental Quality. We worked very, very hard for four years, and we helped Dallas become the first city in the United States to achieve ISO 14001 standard. And what that means is, is we looked at all of our operations across 14 different departments in the city, from the fleet vehicles we used, to the chemicals we cleaned with, to the paper we put in our coffee machine. And we saw how we could do this with less of environmental impact. And this is quite an achievement because this came from Dallas, Texas, not a city in California, not a city in Colorado, not Austin, but Dallas did this first. So Dallas does have a history of being green. So let's fast forward 10 years where a lot of things happened to my department. We actually absorbed some other environmental operations in the city and we doubled in size. And to reflect that change, we changed our name to the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Also that year, because of that merger, we created a combined outreach and engagement team that I am a proud member of. The next year in 2019, Mayor Johnson formed a council committee on the environment. It's called the Environment and Sustainability Committee. The full council meets every Wednesday and you can watch those meetings, but on Monday mornings is when the Environment and Sustainability Committee meet. And if you do watch those meetings, you'll see a lot of my coworkers. Now, if you have heard of our department, it's probably because on May 27th, 2020, the city of Dallas adopted the Comprehensive Environmental and Climate Action Plan known as CCAP. This is very historic. Dallas has never had a plan like this before. And we're one of the few inland cities that has a climate plan. A lot of cities that have climate plans are located along the coast where climate impacts are very, very obvious but Dallas understands the importance of this, how we need to uh, play our part. And you can see all 250 pages of that plan at dallasclimateaction.com. And as the plan moves forward, you'll see a lot of what the city does aligns with the goals and actions in that plan. As a matter of fact, this session fits under goals four and five of the CCAP. So I mentioned that uh, we doubled in size and we absorbed some other environmental operations and those are seen in green. So those included water conservation, storm water management and zero waste. And I wanna talk about one of those briefly and that is storm water. So storm water is another name for rain. It also includes other urban runoff such as lawn sprinkler water. So anytime it rains or you, the sprinklers run, uh, excess water flows off of your property, down your driveway, into the street. It goes along the gutters to the big drain at the end of the street. That drain is called a storm drain inlet, and it's there to remove water really quickly so our streets do not flood. Well, they do such a good job at removing that water that it is not cleaned and it is not treated before it connects to a creek and then into a lake or eventually the Trinity River. So if that water picks up any pollution along the way. That's how that pollution ends up in our water body. So if it picks up litter, bacteria from pet waste, uh, uh, grass clippings, uh, or chemicals from your yard, all of that is carried in our stormwater directly into creeks, lakes, and eventually the Trinity River. So this is just a reminder to be mindful about what you do outside because pollution at home or even in your neighborhood does not stay there. So I mentioned that I'm a member of the outreach and engagement team. What is it that I do? Well, this team wants to empower Dallas to save the earth. And we do that in several ways. One way is uh, trainings like this, where we do virtual presentations. And when we're allowed, we can do those in person. We can talk to HOAs, local clubs and organizations. We also have a lot of activities and seminars for kids all the way from K to college. And uh, we also 
uh, can table at events when the time is right. And not only do we participate in other people's events, we host some of our own. Uh, every August is Clean Air Action Day. And every fall, we have the WaterWise Landscape Tour. It's going to be in early November of 2020. And also in 2020, in October of 2020, will be the first ever Youth Climate Symposium. Now, if you invite us to speak, what do we talk about? Well, we can talk about environmental topics from A to Z, all the way from air quality, energy, green living, stormwater, uh, water conservation, zero waste, and more. But today, we're gonna to talk about your green home inside and out. Today is all about easy, inexpensive DIY cleaners. There are eco-friendly cleaners that you can purchase and there is nothing wrong with that. But if you're not able to go shopping and still want to clean your home, making your own cleaners can be quick and easy. I'm going to share with you how to make your home clean and green inside and out with inexpensive ingredients you probably already have. To do this, just gather some supplies. You're gonna need water, white and apple cider vinegar, dish soap, hydrogen peroxide, rubbing alcohol, baking soda, a natural soap such as Castile soap, some empty spray bottles, a measuring cup and some measuring spoons, and a marker. So I mentioned our website, greendallas.net. Please visit it, visit it to find information and green tips. Plus that's how you can invite us to speak uh, virtually or in person when we're allowed uh, to one of your groups or even your employees or your class. Uh, if you ever need to contact me or anybody on my team, please email greendallas at dallascityhall.com. And also follow us on social media. We are Green Dallas TX on Facebook and we are at Green Dallas on Twitter and Instagram. Now, uh, I want you to note before we really get started is that I am not a doctor. I am not a microbiologist. Please do some research and check with the CDC, the EPA, and your local health authority for their recommendations. I'm gonna show you some alternatives to chemical cleaners that you can use, especially if you have asthma or sensitive skin. Now the CDC does recommend using four teaspoons of bleach to one quart of water to disinfect hard surfaces. So I wanna share with you quickly our website. This is our website, greendallas.net. And if you're interested in inviting us to speak for your group or organization, you're gonna go here to the event requests, click this, you'll fill out an online form. We'll get that information and be in contact soon. But for today, talking about uh, your green home, uh, I would like for you to go here to the top right to the resources tab. Click this. And then you're gonna go under here to literature, the very first one says your green home. This is where you can get a free uh, downloadable PDF of our Your Green Home booklet. It's full of uh, lots of different tips for uh, li living more sustainably. Plus it has many recipes that we're gonna go over today and many more. So you can look here and you can see there are plenty of options you have to clean your home inside and out. So with that, I also want to let you know that you can download this and we're going to uh, be making some of these products. And before we get started, you always wanna test a small area to make sure uh, this product is gonna be safe for your surfaces, especially if you have marble or other natural stones. So with that, gather your supplies and let's get ready for your green home inside and out. Now, let's get to the fun stuff. Well, fun if you like cleaning. Now, speaking of cleaning, cleaning and disinfection are two different things. 
They're often used interchangeably, but they are not the same thing. Cleaning is removing dirt and grime off of a surface. You get that nice slick feel, maybe that squeaky clean and that shine. Disinfecting is killing microorganisms like germs, bacteria, and viruses. It's important to always clean first because those germs, those microscopic organisms can be hiding behind the dirt and grime. So you always want to make sure that you prepare your surface by cleaning it before you disinfect it. Also, disinfection takes time. The product needs time to basically find and kill or seek and destroy those microorganisms. You need to leave the area covered in product for several minutes. And depending on the product, it can be 30 seconds to five minutes. So with that in mind, let's start with cleaning. We're gonna make an inexpensive all-purpose cleaner that you can use on most surfaces. It's very gentle, but remember, test it on the surface first. So what you're gonna need is a spray bottle. I like to use these small bottles, and you can use one similar to this. You can even use travel size bottles. And there's also glass alternatives if you're interested in using less plastic and uh, producing less plastic waste. So this recipe is for a general all-purpose cleaner and it's really simple. All you need is water and dish soap. So you can take uh, two cups of water to one teaspoon of dish soap. So my sprayer, I'm gonna add one cup of water and that means I'm gonna add half a teaspoon of dish soap. Use your favorite dish soap, whichever one that you have, you like the best, and that's the product to use. Now, another little trick is you always wanna add your water to the container first before you add a product, especially soap. Because if you don't, you're gonna get a whole bunch of foam and it's gonna be hard to do, uh, to, to, to even close your bottle. Trust me, I know. All right, so I got my half teaspoon, got my dish soap. And we're just gonna add that right in. And you wanna give it a gentle little shake and that's it. Now you also want to make sure that you label all of your bottles when you're making your own cleaners. And what I like to do is I like to add the recipe onto the label so I always can refill it. Now I, you can have fancy labels, you can write directly on your bottle, these are just mailing labels. Alright, so what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to use this to clean my counter. So just like with our hands, the best way to wash our hands is with soap and water. However, there, we need to be scrubbing our hands for 20 seconds. And that's a good practice to use when you're cleaning your surfaces. So spray it on, let it sit for a bit to help loosen up that grime and dirt. Uh, so soap can also kill some different microorganisms, but let it sit there for a little while. And then when you wipe it off, you wanna you know, put a little elbow grease in there, scrub it kind of hard, because that's gonna help clean the surface. So I'm using a microfiber cloth, and uh, what's neat about these is that they have an electrical charge that helps uh, grab and hold on to dirt and dust and things like that. Now you do have to take special care when you wash these, but they are really good to use for cleaning around the house. And you can see I picked up a lot of grime off of my counter. All right, so next what we're gonna do is we're going to make a glass cleaner. And this is a really simple and familiar recipe. So you're gonna need a container and you're gonna fill it with one part water and one part white vinegar. 
and it doesn't matter the size of your container. Basically, it's half water, half vinegar. And you can use just regular white vinegar. If you can get the lid off. And there you go with your glass cleaner. Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to clean my microwave. So I'm going to first use the all-purpose cleaner we made. And since the door is glass, I'm going to follow that up with the glass cleaner. So I like to use an all-purpose cleaner on my microwave because it's right above my stove. So I do a lot of cooking and there's a lot of grease that comes from my cooking, gets on my microwave, uh, greasy fingerprints and everything like that. So once again, I let the cleaner sit for a few seconds and now we're going to wipe it off. like how we were talking about cleaning, I can feel some of that resistance from stuff being stuck on the surface. And that's why we want to clean first. We want to get all of that off before we disinfect. So I did pick up some stuff off my cloth from the microwave. Uh, and so it's pretty clean, but there are some streaks on the door. Uh, so we're going to follow that up with our glass cleaner. So vinegar is a great cleaner in itself and uh, it also helps give a nice shine to different things. So you can use it on glass, uh, glass appliances, and on mirrors. Alright, so uh, we were talking about cleaning and we've done a little bit of cleaning here. Now let's disinfect. So I cleaned the counter behind me, now it's time to disinfect it. And uh, there are other products you can use besides bleach and those would be rubbing alcohol and hydrogen peroxide. So just like you can use these on cuts and scrapes to help clean those and keep those from getting effect infected, you can also use these on your household surfaces. But make sure you test the small area first. Now I have 70% alcohol. I'm going to use this at full strength. You need to have at least 65% to kill microorganisms. If you're using 99% alcohol, you can dilute it with water. Now, uh, sometimes it can be hard to find different, the different spray bottles, so I'm gonna show you a neat little hack that could help you. So instead of having to get another bottle and pour some of this out, all you need is another sprayer because these sprayers will actually fit directly onto your bottles. So now you can disinfect, you can spray directly from the bottle. So you want to make sure that you thoroughly spray your surface. When you're using uh, rubbing alcohol, you need it to stay on your surface for 30 seconds to kill those microorganisms. That means you need to keep the surface wet. So rubbing alcohol evaporates quickly, so you might have to reapply it. You want that surface to stay wet for 30 seconds so that it can find those microorganisms and destroy them. 
Now, one other thing about using rubbing alcohol is that it doesn't smell really good. So you can add essential oils to it to uh, ha have it smell better. And also different essential oils have different properties. Some of them are antibacterial, some of them are antifungal, some of them are even antimicrobial, so they can actually boost the cleaning power of your product and smell a lot better than rubbing alcohol. Oh yes, that does not smell good. All right, but my surface is clean and it is disinfected. Now, you can also use hydrogen peroxide. Now, the same rules apply. You, are, you can spray it on, and the same thing. You can actually take that sprayer and attach it directly to the bottle, uh, but it needs to stay on that surface for five, uh, well, for more minutes. For anywhere, I've read anywhere from basically one to five minutes is good for hydrogen peroxide. Now, it is good to keep it in the original bottle or you need to use a dark colored bottle. Hydrogen peroxide reacts to light and it doesn't last that long outside of the bottle. But remember, if you're spraying it for disinfection on a surface, test the small area, keep that surface wet for the length of time that you feel comfortable between one and five minutes to disinfect. So, uh, by the way, have you guys ever read uh, Disinfecting Wipes? Let me see if I have some here. All right, so we've all seen products like this, right? Now, if you've actually ever read the back of them, you're actually, it's actually quite surprising. So it says, to disinfect. Use to disinfect hard and non-porous surfaces. Wipe surface to be disinfected. Use enough wipes for treated surface to remain visibly wet for four minutes, four minutes. To kill viruses, let stand 15 seconds. Uh, let surface dry. For highly soiled surfaces, clean excess dirt first. So it's just like what we've been talking about. You want to make sure you clean with soap and water or the cleaner of your choice. Then when you want to disinfect, choose the right product, let it sit the right amount of time, and it needs to stay wet that entire time and then you should have a disinfected surface. So I mentioned that I was gonna share some bonus recipes with you. So I wanna share one of my favorite cleaners and that is orange oil. So this is cold pressed orange oil. It's not quite the same as an essential oil. It's a little bit different. It comes in this really big bottle and it's super concentrated. And it's a, li it's a little expensive, but you only use a little bit at a time and I like it because it's a great all-purpose cleaner. It smells wonderful, and you can actually use it inside and out. So you get a lot of uses out of this one bottle of orange oil. So uh, because it's so concentrated, it says for cleaning solution, you only mix two ounces per gallon of water. Now, most of us probably don't need a gallon of cleaning solution when we're cleaning our house. So when you want to make a smaller amount it's going to be about an eighth of a teaspoon to one cup of water so i'm going to get a cup of water and we're going to mix them up now orange oil is a great degreaser so i like to use it around my stove and also to clean my stove, because that's where I get most of my grease. Now an eighth of a teaspoon is not very much. And you wanna make sure that you, st you give this a shake each time you use it, because it is oil and water and they do tend to separate. So you want to make sure that you shake this up before you use it. And I'll use it real quick on my stove surface and we'll see how dirty that is. And another 
another little trick is when you're you, uh, cleaning stainless steel, uh, anytime you have streaks, you can follow that up after you clean it, follow up with a spray of rubbing alcohol and that helps to shine your stainless steel. So I got uh, a lot of different stuff off of my stove uh, from that orange oil. And like I said, you can follow that up with some rubbing alcohol to make it nice and shiny if you like. And you can add some essential oils to that rubbing alcohol so it smells better. Uh, now I mentioned that you can use this uh, outside, but um, before that, I actually wanna talk to you about how to make your own orange cleaner. So what you can do is make your own orange cleaner. It's not concentrated like the product that we were using, is take a jar with a tight fitting lid and all you need to do is fill it with orange peels. And it doesn't really matter, you just want to stuff it full of orange peels. So this is uh, two oranges. I'm going to put all these peels in here. And then you're going to fill the rest of the jar up with white vinegar. Now you want to put the lid on this and you want to let it sit for about 30 days. So just keep it underneath your sink. And a good idea is to write the date on the jar so you know when it's ready. And this is one that's almost ready. This is one I made before. So I did write the date on it and uh, it has turned the, the vinegar is a little bit orange in color and to use this I don't have to dilute it it's not concentrating so I could like put it straight onto a cloth and use that to clean pour it maybe pour a little bit on the counter wipe that up I can also put it in a spray bottle and spray it that way so this is a nice way to make a um, some uh, cleaner uh, it will it will have an interesting smell because it is white vinegar and oranges uh, but it's, it's a nice, inexpensive way to make some cleaners uh, that you can always have around. So I mentioned that the orange oil could be used outside and uh, orange oil actually kills fire ants. And I don't really know of anybody who likes fire ants. And um, the reason you find fire ants is because you usually step in the mound because they uh, are one of the few ants that make that tall mound above the surface. So they're usually very easy to find, but they're not always that easy to get rid of. But this orange oil product is actually great for fire ants. Now you do need to be careful with it because it can uh, hurt delicate plants. It can also burn your grass. So you want to make sure you stick to the recipe. And you will need a gallon of water. So uh, I like to fill up a gallon jug and you're going to add three teaspoons of orange oil into here. And I've actually already put it in and you actually might be able to see it a little, uh, maybe a little orange color here. And uh, to really make it work well, to, you want it to stick onto the fire ants. So then you wanna add six tablespoons of dish soap. Now this formula, this recipe was actually tested by Texas A&M Extension Service. They did a field trial where they had different ant baits, commercial, commercially available ant baits, the kind that you can purchase, and this mixture of this orange oil, three tablespoons, along with six tablespoons of dish soap. Now, however, in their trial, they used Blue Dawn dish soap. Now, you can use whatever dish soap you want. It will still work. Will, will it work as well as the field trial? Not sure. That field trial showed that this recipe with Blue Dawn had a 70% kill rate. It actually worked as well as some of the commercially available ant baits. Now, uh, different people feel different ways about their soap. So if you don't wanna use Blue Dawn, go ahead and use your favorite dish soap and it will still work. It, you, maybe you're, you're not gonna get that 70%, but I think you're still gonna be happy with the results. 
I personally have used the Dawn and I've used different uh, dish soaps and it has still been effective. Now, when you apply this, so after, and, and also with this, you wanna make sure you put your water in here first before you put your soap. Otherwise, you're gonna have a gallon of suds. So you have your water, you have your orange oil, you have your soap. When you apply this, you wanna go to the mound, you wanna pour it, you wanna start in the center, then you wanna spiral. You wanna work outward from the center and spiral around the ant mound, and you wanna use the whole gallon for that mound. You wanna make sure it goes all the way down and gets as many ants as possible. It actually will kill ants on contact. So it's really um, a nice product to use. Try to keep it off of other plants, especially delicate plants. And uh, it, it might turn your grass, uh, it might burn your grass a little bit, uh, but mine's always grown back. But, um, and also it can kill other things too. Uh, but you know, some, but those fire ants usually are not friendly neighbors either. So, uh, you know, it does work really well with the fire ants and, and it's just one option you have for fire ant control. So the last thing I wanted to share with you uh, in the kitchen is a chemical free way to help keep your pipes, your drains, like your sink drains, uh, clean and fre uh, fresher and working well. And this doesn't involve any chemicals. It's actually just using these mesh strainers. Uh, so these are great to put into your sink. They will catch an amazing amount of things. And then you can actually just throw these away. I just open up the trash can and I tap it along the side, shake all that stuff out, put them back in. And they come in a variety of sizes. So you can also put some in your sink, your bathroom, like your, your bathroom sink drains, maybe even your shower, depending on how your shower drain is. So they can catch a lot of that hair and it won't clog up your pipes. And so speaking of the bathroom, let's do some DIY cleaning in the bathroom next. Let's talk about the bathroom and a little bit about laundry. For an easy DIY bathroom cleaner, all you need to do is mix a quarter of a cup of dish soap with a quarter of a cup of baking soda with about two tablespoons of hydrogen peroxide. You wanna make a paste. You also wanna make a small amount because hydrogen peroxide does not last long out of the bottle. You can apply your paste with a damp sponge. And you wanna make sure that you're working from top to bottom and from left to right. You also want to let this sit for at least five minutes before you rinse. If you need some more abrasion, uh, you can take a damp toothbrush and dip it into baking soda and use that to scrub some stains and your grout. And remember, you want this to sit for at least five minutes also. If you have a lot of soap scum or hard water stains, Borax is a great natural product to try. It is a natural water softener and deodorizer, and you can use it just like the baking soda. Apply it with a damp sponge directly to the surface. Let it rest a few minutes before you rinse it off. Now, while we're waiting for our products to work, I wanted to talk briefly about synthetic sponges. An alternative to a synthetic sponge is actually a loofah. A loofah is a natural sponge. It comes from a dried gourd. And what's neat about these is you can grow these in your yard. They do fantastic in North Texas. And they're also edible. They are a delicious food to eat. And you can let some of them dry, peel them, and you have a natural sponge. These are great for cleaning. Plus, you can use them in your shower in place of these plastic poops to go more zero waste and stay more natural. Now, when you're ready to rinse off your product, if you have a removable shower head, this works great. And remember, you wanna rinse from top to bottom. Now, to keep this nice and shiny and to finish cleaning, take a cloth and dry your tile. 
This will make sure that you've removed everything and make it and keep uh, hard water stains from forming. Now, in between cleanings, after each shower, use a squeegee. Uh, this will remove the water and keep those hard water stains from forming and also help stop those soap scum from forming. Now, I mentioned the laundry. So, borax can do double duty. It can help you clean your bathroom and it can help in your laundry. You can actually add this directly to your wash, regardless of the type of washing machine you have. And since it's a water softener, it will actually soften the water and help your detergent work even better, and you may be able to use less detergent. And it is a natural deodorizer, so it can help with any stinky clothes you might be washing. And now when you're ready to dry your laundry, a great alternative to fabric softener, whether it's dryer sheets or liquid fa fabric softener, are wool dryer balls. These are literally balls made from sheep's wool. And you're gonna put several of these in your dryer and they tumble around with your clothes. And as they impact your clothes, it helps to soften the fibers and soften your clothes without any sort of chemicals. And they create space in the dryer to help the hot air circulate, which can lead to drying your clothes even faster. And one more uh, wonderful thing about these is that you can scent these with essential oils. So you can customize the scent of your laundry uh, also, you can have scented laundry if you're using uh, fragrance-free detergent, and you can have a different scent, scent for each load that you do. So I hope some of these tips and tricks help you go a little greener in your bath and with your laundry. When you're ready to grow flowers for pollinators or vegetables for yourself and your family, you're gonna need to fertilize. There are lots of different organic fertilizers that you can purchase. Some of them are specifically for flowers. Some of them are for vegetables. Some of them can be for both. You can even get organic fertilizers for your lawn. There's even a few that can be used on all three. Regardless of whatever fertilizer you use, it's really important to follow the directions. You don't want to put on more than what's recommended. You don't want to apply them on a windy day and you don't want to apply them before rain or before your lawn sprinklers go off. The wind can blow the product away so it's not where you need it to work. Also, rain can wash these products into a pond, a creek, lake, or eventually the Trinity River. Now in the summertime, dissolved oxygen in our waters is very low. The fertilizer, whether it's organic or not, causes green things to grow. So it can actually cause an algae bloom. And if that happens, the algae will use up all the oxygen that's in the water and the fish could actually die from that. And so it can cause a fish kill. And that is the last thing that we want. So make sure you follow the directions. Don't apply right before rain or on a windy day. The other neat thing about organic fertilizers is they come in lots of different forms. Some of them are dry, some of them are pellets, and some of them are even liquids. They're also made out of a lot of different things. This one happens to be made out of fish and seaweed. And so there's lots of different ones. You just do need to do a little bit of research to find out which one is best for your situation. Now, a lot, the, probably the most famous and popular organic fertilizer that we've all heard of is compost. Compost is something you can purchase or it's something you can easily make at home. It's great to use with your grass clippings and your leaves and your kitchen scraps. There are compost balls. There are compost tumblers. You can make a pile in your yard. You can make several piles in your yard. There's hot compost, there's cold compost. There's even a method called bukashi, which ferments your food waste and your plant matter. And what's neat about that is you can also add in meat, dairy, and even bones. So if you're looking to go zero waste, look into bukashi composting. If you live in an apartment or a condo or you don't have a lot of space, try vermicomposting. That's where you use worms and everything is put into a container. This still generates really rich organic matter that you can use in potted plants, container gardens, or regular gardens. Now, when you're starting off gardening, you might be making a raised bed. Uh, a good rule of thumb is to use 50% good soil and 50% compost and mix that together. You can also do that with your potted plants. 
Now, truth be told, it takes about three to five years for your soil to get healthy enough to really have good vegetable production. And 80% of the time, if you're having a problem with your vegetables or your plants, it's often the soil. So your first year gardening may not be the best year, but be patient and your soil will get healthy and produce a lot for you. It's also a good idea to add mulch to your raised beds and even to your potted plants. This will help uh, retain moisture in the soil. You won't have to water as frequently. And over time, the mulch will even break down and decompose and provide nutrients in the soil for your plants. So with that, let's look into some organic pest control options. A common garden pest are aphids. Aphids are soft bodied insects and they are often yellow or white and they actually will suck the sap and juices out of your plants which can cause damage. An easy way to get rid of aphids that is chemical free is literally to spray them off of the plant with a strong stream of water. So this is milkweed which is the only plant monarch butterflies lay their eggs on and this is what the caterpillars eat and you can see there are a lot of aphids on this plant so all we need to do is spray the aphids off with your water hose and that is one way to treat these insects without any chemicals Texas is famous for its hot, hot summers. Most of us don't like the heat, but there is one thing that does, and that is mosquitoes. As the temperatures rise, mosquito larvae only need three to five days to hatch from the water. So a good way to control mosquitoes is by using mosquito dunks. Mosquito dunks have a bacteria inside that targets the mosquito larva. And all you have to do is break off a piece of the dunk and put it in standing water that you may have around your yard, such as bird baths or ponds, or even inside of rain barrels. Uh, it's really important to add mosquito dunks into your rain barrels periodically, and uh, the directions on the back of the package will explain how much you need to add depending on the size of your water source. Now, something else that does not like the heat are tomatoes, but everybody likes to have fresh garden tomatoes. After it gets to a certain temperature, the flowers will not produce fruit and tomatoes will get stressed in the heat. And that's when they're susceptible to different kinds of diseases and insects. Uh, so keep an eye on your tomatoes and try to identify the pests that are on there so you know how to treat them. Now, one pest that we have is a tomato horn worm. And if you ever have seen them, they're giant green caterpillars and they actually will devour your plant in a day. Uh, you can pick them off by hand. And another option for that the hornworm and also other types of caterpillars that might be attacking your tomatoes or other plants, including cabbages, is uh, Bt. Bt is also a bacteria and you can buy it in a liquid form. You dilute it, follow the directions for application, spray your plants and it can help to control gypsy moths, tent caterpillars, cabbage lopers, imported cabbage worms and the dr dreaded tomato hornworm. So there are lots of organic choices that you can use in your garden if you would like to stay organic. This is a lantana that has mealy bug damage. Mealy bugs are small, soft bodied white insects. It's always best if you could try to identify what pest is causing the problem on your plant. There's lots of different products you can use for mealy bugs and other soft bodied insects. You can buy different kinds of organic insecticidal sprays. Uh, neem oil is a very popular one. Neem oil is made from the leaves of the neem tree. And not only is it an insecticide, it's also a fungicide and miticide. Now, a few things you need to remember with neem oil is that it has to be diluted. Also, it is an oil, so it is kind of sticky. And you apply it to your, you're gonna spray it on your plants and you need to do it in the evening. If it's too hot or the sun hits your plant that has the neem oil on it, it will actually burn the leaves. 
So it's a great product to have, just make sure you follow the directions. Now another product you can use to battle mealy bugs and aphids and other soft bodied insects is insecticidal soap. You can purchase insecticidal soap or you can easily make your own. You will need a, a natural plant-based soap like Castile soap, four cups or one quart of filtered or distilled water, and a sprayer. You can use a pump sprayer or even a hand sprayer. Now optional is apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar will help if you have powdery mildew, plus the vinegar will help keep your spray nozzle clear and free. So add your four cups of distilled or uh, filtered water. Add one tablespoon of Castile soap. And one teaspoon of apple cider vinegar. Now when you apply this mixture, you need to make sure you thoroughly wet the plant. It needs to be dripping wet, and it's actually the Castile soap that kills the mealybug. The soap actually dries out the insect. It dissolves its protective coating and kills the insect. And also remember to apply to the top and bottom of the leaves. To wrap up our discussion about some alternative uh, and organic pest control options, I just want to mention the BT again. I know I talked about how this is good for caterpillars, but it also has some more uses. You can also use it against squash bugs and the dreaded squash vine borer. So this is a great product uh, for multiple pest control situations in your garden. Also, let's touch on weeds for just a second. There actually is a product. This is a high strength vinegar. It's called horticultural vinegar, and it can be used on broad leaf weeds. So it's not good on every weed you're gonna have in your landscape. But honestly, the best tool for weeds is pulling them. So getting a good tool to help remove that root is really the only thing that's going to ensure those weeds do not come back. And it's also best to do it after rain or after you've watered your yard and the ground is softer. You're going to be able to remove all of those roots. Now earlier I was talking about insecticidal soap and how that is great to use against soft bodied insects. Now if you have other insects like ants and fleas and ticks and ones that have a hard shell or exoskeleton, uh, those need a different product. We touched on the orange oil and I'll get back to that in a bit, but another option you have is diatomaceous earth. This is actually crushed up shells of really tiny sea creatures and that means that those crushed up shells are sharp. And as the insect walks over the diatomaceous earth, it actually cuts them and they dry out. So this is a great chemical free way to, um, uh, to get some of those pests in your garden. And if you get, and you really need to use food grade in your garden. And especially if you wanna use this on your pets, you can take the food grade diatomaceous earth and actually dust your dogs and cats with it to kill fleas and ticks. You wanna stay away from their head. And also you don't wanna breathe this in too much cause it can irritate your nasal passages. And like today, it's a really windy day. I don't wanna apply it. 
but I have a fresh fire ant mound here. We recently got some rain, which made my garden really happy, made my grass really happy, and it made the fire ants really happy. So they have a mound. So on a, on a different type of day, I could use this diatomaceous earth and sprinkle it around, and it could, it could kill those ants by cutting them and letting them dry out. However, in this situation, I'm gonna use the orange oil mixture that we talked about earlier. And it is three tablespoons, three tablespoons of orange oil, to six tablespoons of dish soap in a gallon of water. And you want to apply it with that uh, spiral motion. You want to start in the center and spiral it outwards. And I can see that they're already not happy. And you want to use the whole gallon on the mound. And you want to go a little bit on the outside because they might have some trails that lead to the mound. And you can see some of the suds from the dish soap. And remember, the dish soap is there to make sure it sticks to the ants. So now you have several options in your, uh, that you can use in your organic garden to help fight pests. And you can make the best choice for your situation. And I want to thank you very much for giving me your time and hope that you learned something. And remember to visit us at greendallas.net and follow us on social media at GreenDallasTX on Facebook and at GreenDallas on Twitter and Instagram.